I hope that everybody can hear me. And I welcome you to this occasion where we anticipate and celebrate uh, a forthcoming volume. This uh, Tony Harrison and the Classics edited by Sandy Byrne. This is the flyer which I think the, um, the APGRD is going to make available in the chat. We don't have paper copies of the book. If we don't have material copies of the book to, to handle yet, we gather there in the warehouse and that we're waiting to get them in our hands and all of you participating will be able to order the book at a discount with the help of this, of this flyer. I hope it'll be all right if I, I hope you won't mind if I start with quite a personal opening uh, with, with two tributes um, and expressions of gratitude. First, I want to take this personal opportunity to say how immensely Tony Harrison has enriched my life, how he has given me so many wonderful, enriching experiences, which I would never otherwise have been able to have. And um, they've all been infused with his creative energy. He has this extraordinary gift of energy, creativity, of stimulus, both through agreement and through dispute. And for me, it all goes back to the occasion uh, at the very beginning of 1981, which I now reckon must, it must be 41 years ago, I was founding the magazine Omnibus, and I'd heard that he was translating, I'd never met him, um, uh, um, or, or actually I hadn't seen any of his theatre works either, but I'd heard that he was translating the Oristar for the National Theatre. I sent him a letter, would he contribute uh, kindly to, to Omnibus about the experience? And he sent me uh, this postcard uh, with a picture of Munich, but uh, replying from Paris. So that is the very first communication I ever had from Tony. Um, and in it, he said that he wanted to contact me, uh, but he knew how unreasonably wary of one another the theatre and academe can be. And that has been a theme uh, ever since. Um, but he expressed the hope that uh, I'd said we might be allies. He expressed the hope that we would be allies um, and said, uh, I don't, uh, I, I should like to think that we'd be even allies after the National Theatre or style, um, but I'd like to think so, even though I've had to take some perhaps unusual roads to unlock the style. Well, that was the beginning and we didn't actually meet until September of that year when I went to, the first time I met him was when I went to a rehearsal and that was my very first ever uh, uh, interaction with uh, professional theatre makers, theatre practitioners. And that uh, initial um, postcard led me to Delphi for trackers and for laborers of Heracles uh, and other occasions as well, to Carnuntum, Carnuntum in Austria on the Danube near the border with Slovakia for Kaisers of Carnuntum. We went together to Paris to see Ariane Manushkin's Les Atrides. Uh, we went on our strange film journey from Sofia to Plovdiv through the, the middle of Bulgaria to the Turkish border and down the river Hebros down the Turkish border to Alexandrupolis and from Alexandrupolis over the uh, Aegean to Lesbos to make the film Metamorphus. Um, and also uh, other great experiences closer to home at Saltaire, for example, at Salt's Mill, uh, where his productions were put on and there was a wonderful Jonathan Silver, uh, to trips and excursions around Newcastle, and very importantly to Bristol, where I met and learned to work with the absolutely brilliant uh, film director, uh, Peter Symes, who made Tony's, um, nearly all of Tony's uh, television films with him and where I first met when there was a production of um, uh, a production of Misanthrope, where I first met the brilliant and lovely Sean Thomas, who has now been for many years Tony's devoted uh, companion. 
and who is now giving him devoted care at home at Gosforth and Newcastle, now that he's no longer able to travel. So these, these are, are, are personal gifts uh, that have changed my life in, in, in an extraordinary way. And I owe, uh, I can't tell you how much I owe to him personally. But also, as Edith Hall points out in, in her chapter in this new book, Tony has been crucial to the development of reception studies, of classical reception studies in this country and in English. And hence uh, in many other languages and many other countries as well through our interaction with them. Um, and uh, he has helped to establish classical reception studies as something that is alive, something that's forward-looking, is disputed and disputable, something that is not just dilettante, something that is not just cosy. And he was, um, as Edith also confirms elsewhere, a catalyst in our founding of the APGRD in 1996 which makes us an approachable and, and appropriate um, platform host for this occasion this afternoon. And while I've had this personal gift and the APGRD and, and those of us associated with it have personal uh, associations and gratitudes to Tony, um, we're well aware that his gift, his influence, his creative energy has affected many other people uh, both directly and indirectly. Uh, there are so many people whose lives have been in one way or another affected, changed, moved by Tony Harrison's work. Um, and we're well aware that we're not the only people who have been touched by his great gift. Uh, secondly, I want to pay a tribute to Sandy Byrne, the editor of this volume. She has been a tireless advocate um, for Tony's work, uh, a tireless critic and exponent um, uh, who has opened up many aspects um, and brought out Tony's uh, significance. I think I'm right in saying that the, after the, the first, uh, back in the days of, of, of Blood Axe being Tony's main publisher, uh, Neil Astley brought out this collected volume in 1991, and I think after that, uh, Sandy was the, the first really significant study and two volumes that came out almost simultaneously. Uh, she brought out this uh, critical study of the poetry, H, V and O, with this mar marvelous portrait uh, on the front. That came out in uh, 1998. And just the year before, she had collected together 15 contributors for Tony Harrison Loina, with the portrait by David Hockney on the cover. And um, this was actually on the occasion of his 60th birthday. And let, let me just quote you the last sentence of her introduction. This collection salutes Harrison at 60, in mid-stride, bard and Loina, scholar and satyr, playwright, filmmaker, director, performer, always and only poet. That was at his 60th birthday. And then uh, at his 80th birthday, along with some splendid celebrations, um, Edith Hall put together this volume, uh, New Light on, on Tony Harrison, uh, which has also many uh, wonderful essays and appreciations uh, in it. Now we are approaching Tony Harrison's 85th birthday. Um, and um, at this point, uh, Sandy has got to together the, this volume specifically on Tony Harrison and the classics. And that is what we're going to be uh, discussing and celebrating this afternoon. And I would like at this point to, to hand over to Lorna Hardwick. Now, Lor Lorna is a, an editor of the series Classical Presences in which this book appears. But in this particular case, 
she is a contributor rather than an editor. And um, Lorna is always good for opening up a discussion. So if you're there, Lorna, I will hand over to you at this point. Thank you very much. Right, thank, thank you very much, Oliver. Um, it's marvelous to be able to celebrate the publication of this book. Um, many thanks to OUP and to Fiona and the archive uh, for hosting. And I know that I'm speaking for all the contributors in thanking Sandy for all the hard work she's put in to bring this project to fruition, making sure that a volume on Tony Harrison and the classics takes its place in the classical presences list alongside those on Ted Hughes, Robert Grave, and there's also one on the OUP list of um, the classics and, Shea, and Seamus Heaney. Um, and I understand as well that uh, Maureen Alden in Belfast is leading a team working on Michael Longley. So it does seem as though those, that, that series, mini series is going to go on. Now, as Oliver mentioned, um, as a contributor to this particular volume, um, I obviously had to stand back from my role as joint editor of the, of the Classical Presences series. Um, so I'm especially grateful to Jim Porter, co-editor of Classical Presences, who, who took on much more than his fair share of work in the assessment and approvals process for the proposal. And I suspect he's going to call that one in on me in the future, you know, so I'm, I'm beaming up to that. Now I know that, and some of you will be well aware, some publishers are cautious about publishing edited collections, partly because of issues of, of coherence and so on. However, when you look at the range of material that simply has to be discussed in relation to Tony Harrison, you can actually see the virtues of having a collaboratively produced book. But collaboration needs leadership. And in addition to her expertise as a Harrison scholar, I honestly think Sandy deserves a medal for her patience and good temper during the whole process. I mean, they say editing a, a, a collection is sort of like herding cats. Well, I think some of the cats, you know, strayed off piece quite a lot. I know this one particular one did, and um, it was absolutely marvelous that we sort of retained that sense of direction and encouragement that, that Sandy provided the whole time. Now, over the years, as, as Oliver mentioned, the willingness of Tony Harrison to discuss his work and to put documentation and ideas in the public domain has in itself been a major contribution to research at all levels, from undergraduate dissertations to theses to journal articles to collections of source material to monographs, and to all those debates and discussions that go on outside formal publications and which are you know, so valued to the lifeblood of um, not only our own discipline, but much beyond that. In the last five years or so, we've seen some outstanding examples of scholarship on Harrison's classical work that have built on the earlier research by literature colleagues such as Sandy herself, who's been a great leader with that. Now, when I was looking through the final version of the book, I found myself constantly drawn to the implications of Tony Harrison's work for investigations that go beyond the individual fields of literature, film, performance studies, translation, history of scholarship, as well as classics. In fact, one almost is not separating those out. One has to look at the whole. But three aspects seem to me to be particularly important, both for existing and future Harrison scholarship and for topics that are becoming increasingly prominent in arts and humanities research and teaching and beyond. And in order of particularity, they are the scholar poet, the ethics of literary activism, an international and global reach. First of all, the, the scholar poet. Now, Tony Harrison's scholarship has been extensively discussed and documented, including valuably in this volume and in recent publications. It's well known that he's one of the last of the cohort of grammar school pupils in the United Kingdom who had the chance of a classical education from an early age. And the results of that training, not only in terms of language and text, but also in terms of approach, are there for all to see in his work, in his documentation, his choice of text, and so on. However, that's only part of the scenario. And I think I've found that his work cast special light on the relationship between scholarship and creativity, something that's been, I think, um, increasingly discussed um, in recent years, 
partly in relation to performance, partly in relation to the ways in which creativity seems sometimes to be ahead of, of scholarship. Now, I don't doubt that Harrison could have been a fine academic, and indeed is in the broadest sense. But someone can be a fine scholar and at the same time be, um, I hesitate to use the term, be respectable. Play safe would be to put it too strongly. A creative practitioner can't be that. He or she has both the freedom and indeed the compulsion, internal and external, to take risks, to positively chase that frisson of public failure and experiment and further experiment and further failure and so on. And of course, the best scholars do that too. But to do so is not the same kind of sine qua known that it is for creatives. Harrison's lifelong learning, his combined erudition and aesthetic risk-taking with lived experience, lived experience that ranges from the class context of his early life, to his work in Africa, Greece, the Balkans, um, Central Europe, um, almost wherever you care to mention. His scholarship has been a springboard for the other aspects of his creativity and not a corral that limited it. Now, understanding the nexus between creativity and scholarship, I think also makes special demands on Harrison criticism. I mean, you can see from, from the contents of this book, archive, archive skills, languages and texts, ancient and modern, papyrology, investigation of socioeconomic contexts, exploring relationships between vernaculars, historical linguistics and translation strategies, performance analysis, geopolitics, cultural politics, the intersectionalities of class, race, gender. I mean, Harrison has been one of the people who have assured that um, class analysis is not marginalized or uh, dis discarded from, from the work that classical reception is doing. The list goes on and on. And no wonder then that Sandy had to lead such a diverse team of contributors. Secondly, ethics. Now, Harrison is an activist, um, a scorchingly interventionist writer and speaker. And so far as current insults are concerned, I think woke is far too mild. And the trendy right wing um, taunts about virtue signaling just make me laugh. There's a directness in his work, in his choice of topics and texts, in his voice as the narrator, the maker of images, the commentator. It is not found in other poets who also have a strong ethical sense, but who've preferred to adopt more, shall we say, covert techniques. Against the charge that Harrison appropriates text for political end is, I think, a counter argument that a translator, adapter, a rewriter of Greek and Roman material has an ethical obligation to make the direction and extent of his or her agency crystal clear, particularly to people who are perhaps not um, familiar with the anti-text and all the mediating texts and ideas that, are, that he's used. That kind of ethical issue is being discussed in, in other areas, for example, history of debates about domestication and foreignization in translations. But Harrison, it seems to me, brings together a number of things. The present resonances of his poems, plays and films are also held in tension. With that sense of distance and strangeness that includes time, place, languages, media and aesthetic. And this creates sites for the exposure of local, national and international brutalities in the past, in the present. Harrison's poetry on the page, in performance on the stage, in film, projects a public voice on issues that are and ought to be of public concern. And that is one aspect and a, a dominating aspect, I think, of his um, ethical contribution. He doesn't do easy resolution. You won't find any comfortable catharsis. There's no truck with notions that the arts provide an aestheticized retreat. Timelessness doesn't mean a vacuous universalism. It embraces intersecting temporalities that turn the lens on the traumas and catastrophes of every time and every place. 
Harrison, I think, is an important figure in trauma and catastrophe literature. Shocked readers and spectators are offered no hiding places. And the capacity of the arts to do this is perhaps one reason why successive governments have sought to marginalize them. You only have to encounter Harrison's work to realize that the arts are dangerous. They're dangerous to the unfettered exercise of power, to complacency, and to refusal to face up to past, present, and future. And that brings me on to the third area in which I think um, Harrison is increasing, his, his work is, and Harrison criticism is increasingly going to um, take an important role. And that's internationalism and globalism. Now, his internationalism is rightly celebrated, as is his localism. Term globalism is now rapidly becoming a prominent strand in debates inside and outside the academy, including current re-examinations of classics as a discipline with all its past problems and its present opportunities. And this extends into perceptions of Greek and Roman antiquity in public as well as private spheres. Now, global is I think a problematic concept. Um, risks include reintroducing universalism under another hegemonic umbrella, one that in popular capitalist usage at least privileges neoliberal ideologies, corporatism, etc. All anathema to Harrison, I'm sure. However, the implications of the global field for crossing existing boundaries, recognizing new models of networks of knowledge, communication and empowerment have potential for classicists. And I rather suspect that scholars of the future are going to look back at Harrison's work as um, marking quite an important watershed in, in that development. In related areas, uh, Gugi Wathiongo, the Kenyan critic has highlighted some key issues in the 2012 publication, these well -led lectures, Global Ethics, in which he celebrated the role of translation as, I quote, the language of languages that, I quote, opens the gates of national and linguistic prisons, making it an ally of world literature and global consciousness. And translation he uses in, in, in the widest sense to include translocation, transpl transplantation, and so on. Now, Tony Harrison's fine tuning of the relationships between vernaculars, class perspectives, ancient and modern languages and situations resonates with that kind of cultural activism. Furthermore, um, many of you will have seen uh, Jacques Bomberg's recently published book, Global Classics, which raises some possibilities about how classicists can engage with understanding of how cultural capital has been accumulated and used. Um, and how that kind of basis might change. Romberg comments on classics as a transdisciplinary enterprise and as a source of data. And it seems uh, marvelous in the context of being hosted by the archive and celebrating the publication of, of, of Sandy's um, co -ed uh, edited book. We're actually bringing together those, those two aspects. It seems to me that the poems, plays, film poems, paramaterial and activism of Harrison provide precisely that necessary raw material, as well as providing goads, and I use the word advising goads, for future scholars and practitioners, both to explore possibilities and also to challenge the assimilation of any easy acceptance of, of, of theory and practice. Um, just because it's a new way of looking at things. Tony Harrison's relationship with ancient Greece and Rome and their mediation does offer us that searing combination of commitment and unease. And I think it's that combination that's one of the most important things to celebrate today. So back to you, Oliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Lorna. I thought that was a a wonderful encapsulation of both the, the creativity, the challenge, uh, the openness, uh, the, the uh, activism of Tony Harrison, um, and will, I hope, give plenty of material for any discussion that we have 
uh, after Sandy has had her say. So I hand over to you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Oliver, and thank you, Lorna. I'm delighted to see Tony Harrison's name writ large on the cover of a volume in this series. I I'm less happy to see mine writ large there. I wanted all the contributors' names to be there, or failing that, to be writ large on the back, but unfortunately, the format of OUP won't allow that. They're, they're smaller than they should be. This book is very much a collaboration. It's not just about me. I, I'm not the leader, as has been said. I'm just one of the contributors. I wrote the introduction and a chapter. And I want to pay tribute to the contributors, not only for putting up with me as an editor, but for producing such insightful work, which made me look at Harrison in new ways. And I've been reading Harrison since at least 1980, so that's saying something. I hope you like the cover. I hope you like the large, very appropriately phallic con uh, cement silo with Heracles written at the bottom and Harrison standing exultant at the top with a, a collaborator. It's one of the paradoxes that Harrison explores that he writes poetry. He writes for the page, the screen, the stage, and that it's considered high art. And yet he is advocating the opening up of art and deploring the exclusion from high or serious art of certain groups of society. One of the lines in one of his poetry is, I'd like to be the poet my father reads, but he's very clearly aware that his father won't read his poetry. So one of the things I wanted to emphasize to my collaborators, my co-writers of this volume was clarity. I wanted them to make the work jargon free to the extent that that's possible, to the extent that it's possible to make a work that is in going to necessarily include words in Latin and in Greek accessible, and they did. I'm so grateful to them for doing that, for continuing to work to make Harrison's writing accessible, just as he tries to make poetry, whether on the stage or the screen or the page, accessible, and yet erudite, and yet intelligent, and yet, as Lorna says, challenging, forcing us to confront things, interventionist, asking us to think. The contributors did that. I'm also very grateful to them, particularly to the classicists for being so welcoming, so for being so patient with and welcoming of someone from out with their discipline, a, a, an English literature person. I'm especially grateful to Lorna Hardwick for so kindly commenting on the parts of the introduction that touch on classical reception, a subject about which I know very little or did know very little before I encountered these essays, and to Oliver for kindly answering questions about Greek lexicon, but for joining with me in a, a, a really interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary attempt to show this multifaceted author and to bring together the insights of theatre practitioners as well as scholars, those interested in drama, as well as those interested in cinema and in television, and to produce a, I think, and I hope, rounded, and, and never be comprehensive, but rounded and wide ranging piece of work. I know that a number of the contributors are here and I, I want you much more to hear from them than from me. I know Lottie and Edith are both here and Stephen's here and I think Henry also and Geraldine. So I'd like to hand over to them to see if they would like to say something about Harrison or their essays or the volume or anything else. Um, thank you, thank you, Sandy. Thank you, thank you, Lorna, for pushing it through. 
I'm just so, you know, the more stuff that helps us understand this signal importance of this great man. And for me in particular, uh, one of my very few real soulmates, I feel trying to turn this ridiculous subject, or it's actually, it's not a ridiculous subject, a subject that has been used in such overwhelmingly ridiculous ways and continues to do so, just a true ally in what studying the most important thousand years, I think, intellectually in human history can do for progressive causes. Yeah. But I would like also, um, I may look like I'm the only one with a glass of red wine. Um, I'm doing that because I've, well, it's a long story, but oh, well, I'm not. <laughs> um, can we just address Barry Cryer's spirit? Right. It, 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 I'm sure Lottie will have something to say about this because she spent a whole hour on a pavement outside King's College London. But one of the most moving things I've ever seen um, at the 80th birthday celebrations where Barry Cryer was one of the guests of honour and sat opposite Tony, one of the most moving things I have ever heard was them reminiscing about performing as undergraduates a very choir and did a year at Leeds <laughs> University in England. He saw his first year results and left for London in the comedy. But in that first year, he, Wale Shoyinka and Tony Harrison did stand up together um, at the Leeds Variety Theatre. Varieties, actually, sorry, they call it. Tony would like that. Different kinds of variety <laughs> of humour. And I was terribly sad with this thing coming up actually that uh, Barry Cryer who, who who made that evening yeah I don't know if those of you who came some of you did Hawley there were a lot Henry lots of you lots of people who were actually at the party um he raised the toast and just the idea of these two boys of 18 19 and apparently Tony was the straight man <laughs> to Barry Cryer's uh Humorous. And I haven't seen Tony this week. I'm now sitting in my ex council house in County Durham, and I will be seeing him later this week. It's very wonderful for me um, now to be back, able to see Tony within um, 20 minutes, really, of my second home. Um, and I will tell him what happened tonight. He went all sarcastic about attending tonight, you know as he's quite capable of, but I will tell him, but I know that he was very upset about Barry's death. So could we just raise a glass to one of the greatest comic geniuses of the 20th and 21st centuries? To Barry. That's me. I'll quickly jump on that then, Edith. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I have to say that it's been an absolute pleasure working on this. And thank you, Sandy, so much for herding us all. Um, it, I know it hasn't been easy and uh, she's done a fabulous job. So thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. And also I appreciate the opportunity to talk about Tony. And I know a lot of people here um, have got their own personal memories of Tony and have had their opportunities with Tony. Um, I have had a number of incidences where I've had nice opportunities to talk to him for long periods of time and things like that. And I just hope that kind of what we've written in our in our um, kind of edited volume kind of gives people a glimpse of exactly who he is as a gentleman and um, how amazingly um, educated and interesting and genius he is. So um, I really do hope that kind of comes across. And um, yes, as Edith says, Barry Cryer. <laughs> <laughs> I had a wonderful conversation with him at Tony Harrison's birthday and um, yeah to imagine the both of them on stage together uh, is something that um, I'm sure that everyone here will um, think about and um, I hope that um, kind of everyone enjoys the fact that um, kind of Tony and Barry did have this kind of life together but I kind of wish I wrote about that now in the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> There, uh, there are no records though, Lottie. There are none. I have I have written to every single local history society in Lee. I what I would give for like, you know, two photographs of those three gentlemen together 
you know, or, or, or just the two of them. Just in case international um, attendees here don't know, Barry Cryer was one of the most seminal comic writers in British comedy. There is no famous British comedy that didn't have his imprint. And he was one of Tony's very, very, very best friends. And he died about a week ago, was it? 10 days ago um, in his early eighties. Uh, and everybody absolutely adored him. Um, and Lottie had a whole hour on the pavement outside of the Strand with him, didn't you Lottie? Well, yes, it was Trish trying to get him into a taxi <laughs> in central London, which is always difficult to do. But um, yeah, he was a wonderful man, very glowing about Tony. And it would have been lovely to hear his voice this evening if he, if he was able to. But um, yeah, so I will now pass on to one of our other contributors, because I know there's a number of us here. OK, well, uh, I'm, I'm the kind of humble Latinist on this project because Tony's interests have been mostly on the Hellenic side. But I think on the first or second occasion I met him, I can't remember which, uh, he heard I was a Latinist and he then recited to me the first 20 lines of Lucretius from memory. Uh, Lucretius with whom he shared quite a lot, sort of passion and uh, anti-convention and uh, being a great poet. Uh, but it's been a real privilege to be involved with this project, uh, studying someone who my truly respect and uh, admire, not just as one of the great poets of our time, but as one of the great advocates of a larger view of classics. I think Tony's one of the main people who has made classics, not just as it were approachable, but also an instrument of change, an instrument of uh, liberal thinking in this country from a time when it was certainly not like, like that and I think we all owe him a great debt and I'm very grateful to Sandy for asking me to participate in this project and for her kindness as editor and efficiency um, and I'm, I just feel privileged to be involved in every way so thank you all. People keep saying how tough it was it wasn't you were all amazing I hardly had to do any editing at all. C can I quickly say something? Please, please do. Yeah, hi. So um, I'm going to echo everyone else and say, sorry, Sandy, you're just going to have to put up with this, but, um, but I'm really grateful to you for inviting me to contribute to this book. And in particular, to allow me to follow um, an idea that I'd had for some time and not really done much with it and actually get it into writing. And that was to see um, Tony's view of Hecuba um, as it's described by reading his own play, Fram, seeing Fram as a commentary on his relationship with classics, with Hecuba in particular, um, and uh, with Gilbert Murray. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed that. And I had enormous fun at two archives, at the APGRD, of course, but also at Leeds Brotherton Library, where I really got stuck into his notebooks which are wonderful things. And I was sorry that I hadn't booked a lot more time to spend going through those notebooks. So I'm sure all of you have um, already bit, sort of uh, made a contact with those. But if there is anyone on this call who's not been to look at um, Tony's notebooks in the Leeds Brothers and Library, I highly recommend it. They are really enjoyable and a fascinating insight on his approach and his incredibly detailed approach to his work. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be in the company of so many amazing contributors whose work I've admired for a long time. So thank you again, Sandy, for allowing me to do that. I'm glad you mentioned the Leeds Brotherton special collections because uh, lots of us have been there and have benefited from, from looking at all the many notebooks and it, it is an astonishing collection. Um, Tony Harrison sent them there some years ago now and they've been well catalogued. They are accessible. You can become a member of the library very easily and it, it is a very rich resource so thank you for bringing that up and also he was offered vastly more money to send them to various uh, obscenely rich american private universities and it's absolutely typical of tony that for a very very modest sum they've gone back to leeds where he got his education um, for to be close to the citizens of Leeds. Um, 
I can't think of anything more symbolic of the man than that. Um, can I come in here? Yes, please. It would seem the most appropriate point, given what you've just been saying, because my chapter is about uh, insights from the Tony Harrison archive in the Leeds Brotherton Library. Um, and uh, yes, it was um, an amazing kind of experience to to discover that this was here. So I'm, I'm speaking to you from Leeds. Um, I should have said that to begin with. Um, I work in a classics department at Leeds and I've used the Brotherton archive and Tony Harrison's collection, especially not only um, for research on this chapter and another forthcoming chapter, but also in teaching undergraduates, um, encouraging them to understand the processes involved in, in classical receptions and translation through uh, looking at Harrison's amazing notebooks and um, and other items in the archive and also the West Yorkshire Playhouse or Leeds Playhouse archive which uh, which has um, you know relevant items from from one of his, his productions there um, so that they can see you know costume designs and sets and stage alongside drafts and and all of the research that, that Tony did um, while making those drafts and successive drafts pasted over each other in the notebooks and, and that kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's an amazing rich resource uh, that I've uh, been discovering over the past few years, both as a, as a researcher and a teacher um, in classical reception. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, um, Sandy, for the opportunity to to write a little bit about that and to to share some of those those insights. So it's the tip of the iceberg because it's such an amazing and large um, resource. You could write many, many uh, books and, and uh, chapters of, about the, the things that are still to be discovered in there, and they're still they're still being catalogued. You know, there've been the the, the accessions of of uh, Tony's materials into the library have happened in batches over recent years. So some of them are, are much more um, uh, fully explored or explored by, by the archivist cataloging it, that is, um, than, than the more recent accessions. Um, so there's, there's so much more to be done there. Um, but yeah, thank you, Sandy, for the opportunity, the invitation to, to explore that in this chapter and, um, and to Lorna on behalf of the series um, to, to get to include that. I very much wanted to have something in the volume about that archive, as it is so special. So thank you, Owen. Can we just all say thank you to Sarah Prescott of the Archive, who I think certainly helped me unbelievably find the things I needed to. She is one of the best archivists in the world, and Tony is very, very fond of her. I would like her name to be here if we're going to thank the Archive. I'm sure Owen agrees. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, hello, everyone. It's great to see everyone, first of all. And um, yeah, I've I can't wait to get my hands on this book. Um, it's fantastic. I wrote a bit about um, Prometheus, um, Tony Harrison's um, 1998 <laughs> feature film, film poem uh, extravaganza. And uh, I, I loved working on it. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have been, yeah, just getting up close to Tony Harrison's work, particularly his kind of visual and trans-historical um, imagination, which is just uh, kind of electrifying. Um, I, um, I've recently been lucky enough to be teaching uh, Tony Harrison to or his works to, to my students. And it's so nice to see particularly how um, his work speaks also to, uh, to the new, newer, you know, younger people, new generations. Um, of classicists, for various reasons, uh, believe it or not, um, find that the subject quite hard to love. Um, but through Tony's work, um, they kind of find a new way of being able to love it. Um, so, um, yeah, that's just what I want to say. And um, thank you very much, Sandy, for, for all your work. Well, thank you, Henry. I, I'm very pleased that someone wrote extensively about the film work and in particular about Prometheus. So that was great to have you with us. Hallie, before the contribution was looking at the place of ruins in Tony's work, not only his engagement with the ruins of the past, and particularly the classical world, but also the way in Prometheus in particular that he engaged with the ruins of the modern world. 
and the ways in which we are willing to look at the past and the beauty of ancient ruins, but our unwillingness to acknowledge the ruins that are being created, particularly in the northern mining communities in the UK, in the industrial rust belt of the United States, and the importance of his poetry for making us see the suffering in our midst, that it's not just an ancient suffering, but it's a modern suffering as well. But I think on a, on a more personal note, I'd like to say, you know, certainly my encounters with Tony's poetry changed my life. Um, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in rural Canada on a farm. You know, I grew up near a town of a thousand people, but that was far too urban for my father. So I lived 20 minutes outside of a town of a thousand people. I didn't know what the classics were when I arrived at university, but thought that Latin sounded quite interesting. Um, and so I took a Latin class, which of course led to a Greek class. But Tony's poetry opened the world to me quite literally, not just in a literary sense, but also uh, you know, he led me to travel to Greece, he led me to travel to England. But it's not just the things that I've, the places I've gone, but it's also the way that I see the world, the extent to which his brilliance in making connections that most of us would simply never see fundamentally changes the perspective on not just poetry and literature, but how we treat each other as human beings. Um, and there really is a remarkable body of work that is so richly deserving of scholarly attention. Um, and so I will echo everyone else in saying, thank you so much to Sandy for making this book possible um, and for shepherding us all through in the middle of a pandemic, um, which not only led to sort of all sorts of personal hurdles that people needed to clear, but also I know caused all sorts of issues on the publishing side. Um, but thank you so much, Sandy, for all of your work on this. Um, and of course, to all the other contributors as well for rounding out this extraordinary volume that I can't wait to physically hold. Thank you, Holly. I hope you won't have to wait too long. But, uh, at the moment, we don't have coffees, but we are promised that they are in the pipeline. So now I think we're going to throw everything open to anybody for questions and comments. Uh, yes, thank you. I, th I think it's going to fall to me to um, uh, sort of marshal the questions in the chat. So if you've got questions, and we've got a couple already, um, please do um, send them in. We've got, um, you know, minutes or so. Um, but before we do, I just, I, I knew this was going to be a good session, um, uh, not least because as Oliver and Edith and multiple people have, have suggested, um, the APGRD will always remain truly indebted to this extraordinary, wonderful, generous man. And um, I will add that I spent, you know, some of the best years of my life as an undergraduate uh, working in the Brotherton Library. And I was really aware, as many of us were, that Tony Harrison had been there before, Wale Shoyinka had been there before. So it's, um, yeah, in many ways for me, listening into your various reminiscences, um, a, a very, very moving. Um, I'm also uh, with the question from Carl in the chat. So I'm going to hand back to Oliver um, to, you know, um, say thank you to everyone and, well, thank you. And, and that, that discussion of the films uh, you know, reminded me, I mean, Black Days is for the Bride, for example, yeah. an incredibly moving film, a uh, wonderful film uh, set in a dementia hospital. And, um, and uh, all the ones he did about uh, um, the funerals in Naples um, and um, the, about uh, blas the Blasphemers Banquet, uh, which is extraordinarily relevant uh, to us today. I, I must pull things together. Uh, it's been great to, to partly to see so many people, to see so many of the contributors to this volume, uh, to see so many people who have collaborated uh, with us and have all between us brought Tony uh, into greater attention. And I mean, I was very pleased to hear Henry say how um, his students are responding so well to, to, um, to his classes on Tony Harrison. Um, it, uh, it's been um, in some ways very, very moving, at least to me, and I think to, to, to many of us, for us to be able to gather in this way, uh, even if only in what the Greeks call postage stamps, grammatosima, to see each other in these, these little boxes. Um, 
and to take the opportunity to bring bring on board people who have contributed so much to uh, the academic side of Tony Harrison, although academic, of course, and Tony Harrison are two words that don't go together uh, with complete comfort. So thank you very much to Lorna. Thanks for e to Edith. Thanks, uh, Sandy. Um, I, have, I have to confirm other people uh, who say quite rightly that what Sandy has done, she's being very modest about it. It was not yeah. an easy task by any means. So thank you very much. And we look forward to this book uh, hitting the world and making a big impact, a big splash. Um, and um, just to, to say that I think we've all been touched this afternoon by something of that creative gift, something of that ex extraordinary energy, which goes out in kind of waves um, from Tony's central creativity. So thank you very much, everybody. And we hope to meet again before long. Bye-bye.